Okay, now we can move to the uh, second keynote of the day with uh, Professor Jose Ignacio Latorre from uh, TII, who will be speaking about quantum algorithms for cryptography. Uh, Jose Ignacio, the floor is yours. Thank you, Nashua. <clears throat> so first of all, let me thank Nashua and Mark and all the organizers of this workshop. It's very nice to see that the activity at TII is starting to take off. So <clears throat> this is uh, what I'm presenting is a collaboration uh, between us, the Quantum Center at TII and the Crypto Center also at TII. Uh, and it is just natural because um, we have, uh, we are putting together teams uh, that of young people that are learning very fast. And in my opinion, the future, at least in, in the field of post-quantum and uh, quantum cryptography, will need a lot of uh, uh, common research between teams which are experts in cryptography and teams which are experts in quantum mechanics. So in this particular case, our team is made with Nashua, with Emmanuel Bellini, with Carlos Bravo Prieto, Self and Ruge, uh, Mark Manzano, Victor and Sergi Ramos Calderon. And let me just go back and show that the presentation has been prepared together with Sergi. So, what is the idea? Well, the idea is that uh, noisy quantum computers are here. It is not uh, a dream, it's a reality. And uh, it is time to understand in depth what quantum computer can do. Well, we have a certain results uh, that go back to the 90s. The, the fundamental research by Grover uh, is that uh, we do have an advantage, which is a square root of advantage when we search an unstructured database. Uh, this is a universal advantage, which is a primitive for quantum computation that can be applied in a vast amount of uh, problems. We also know that if we can exploit the underlying structure of a problem, we may even gain more. So this is a case of Shor's factorization. You should think that factorization could be treated with Grover. And uh, one could um, uh, typically, the most naive way of looking for factors would be try every number between one and root of n. Well, uh, this space of search is screw root of n, well, Grover would have another screw root on top of that. But it turns out that because of the detailed properties of the factoring problem, in particular, the fact that it can be mapped to finding a subgroup, in this case, the translation subgroup, then we can use the Fourier transform. And it's, it's a fact that the Fourier transform when done with quantum mechanics, it's exponentially faster than the Fourier transform done with uh, classical means. And there we gain an exponential factor with, um, with respect to other known classical methods. There are many, many more problems, you know, you know, a hundred problems by now that we have proofs of uh, advantage using a quantum computer over a classical computer. And we even have theorems that says that the classical Turing machine is included efficiently in the quantum Turing machine. So we can only gain if we are clever enough to exploit the structures of the problems. Uh, a lot of, uh, I, I would like to stop all the quantum hype. Many people claim, okay, we have quantum advantage, and, uh, you know, this is a fantastic result. Well, let me provide a word of, we have to be a little bit cautious, okay? Uh, the quantum advantage that has been proven by Google or recently by China are really useless uh, computers. They cannot address any relevant problem. And uh, it's simply that you have tuned the problem so that that machine is particularly good. It's as if you would put together atoms and claim that uh, you have made a molecule, and that molecule is extremely difficult to be realized classically. So this is a kind of advantage that we are getting. Of course, it's a little bit more than that, because indeed there is a lot of work done 
at the level of the superconducting qubits, how we control them, how we stop the, the cross talk and so on. But all these problems that have been solved under the name of boson sampling, they only deliver a probability distribution, which is typical of quantum systems, and very difficult to prove on a classical computer. We do have problems. We have experimental problems. We, it's difficult to have large amount of qubits. It's difficult to keep coherence time. It's very difficult to make the readout in an efficient way. We have problems of the qubits talking to each other and they shouldn't be talking to each other. And in theory, we have problems. We, we have very few algorithms which are powerful. We, have, we lack uh, powerful algorithms. And, uh, and we have a problem with uploading large amount of data. So this is something which is very rarely mentioned. But uh, how, if you need an exponential time to, to put the data, even if you save time in the computation, you're not saving time. It has a practical uh, fact. Uh, advantages that nobody's mentioned is that quantum computers run on a much uh, lower amount of energy and definitely it can use a lot of space, the Hilbert space is a very huge place where we can map problems. There are very recent papers by the group of uh, Treskill uh, in Caltech, which I like it very much. Huh? They are addressing a new category, which is what can you do with a quantum computer if you have data? So a little bit the equivalent of training neural networks. How can you train quantum computers if you have a lot of classical data? So progress is being performed every day. Um, so let me come down to Earth. Quantum coding is not simple. Uh, indeed, one, you know, we have this idea, which is uh, that you don't work with zeros or ones, but with uh, qubits that are on the arbitrary uh, complex superposition of zero and one. You have alpha times zero plus beta times one. And when you extend that to very many qubits, well, you can handle on n physical degrees of freedom, you can handle two to the n uh, logical degrees of, of freedom. And therefore, a quantum computer is like a fantastic encoder of information. And moreover, every time you take action on your n qubits, it takes place on all the superpositions at a time. So it's a massive parallel computer. Well, this is very good. But on the other hand, the laws of quantum mechanics are what we call unitary evolution. So therefore, you cannot have certain operations which are very common in the classical world. For instance, you don't have a safe button. You can check that the uh, <clears throat> unitarity, linearity of the actions is in control and superposition produce a theorem, the non-clonic theorem, so that there is no way to save a state. You cannot have qubits and suddenly copy the state and proceed again and do things as you do in a classical computer. All operations must be reversible. May I remind you that when people study reversible computation very many years ago, they realized that you need Toffoli gates and not do it with two body uh, gates in classical computation. Uh, in quantum mechanics, it turns out that you can reduce a Toffoli gate to two body complex gates. But in classical computation, there are no complex numbers. So, so it's, it's a fantastic fact that quantum mechanics deals with complex functions, that uh, wave functions, that you can have these uh, Toffoli gates made as two body uh, interactions. And readout is probabilistic. So actually, the, the role of the algorithm is to bring your state to something that when you measure, you will consistently get the result you're looking for, which is a solution. So actually, all things together, quantum logic is uh, orthogonal to the classical logic. You need to, to be trained from zero. All the things we will <clears throat> present are done with the language that we had developed at uh, at TII, which is called Kibo. It is an open source language, which is made to serve the full stack of programming to run a quantum computer. So it's the entry point to analyze algorithms, but it talks to the middleware and finally to the part of the equipment that produces the pulses that finally go into the qubit. So Kibo is meant to control the full stack of actions till the 
your conceptual logical action till the actual action you take on the on the qubits and the readout and the collecting of statistics everything so this is our framework kibo uh, you're invited to visit kibo.science and then you have a github you can download uh, all of kibo with plenty of examples so the goal in what we have done in in this uh, collaboration between uh, crypto and quantum is really a very modest thing uh, again i'm i want to to bring this this idea that uh, the real science uh, is not based on news that appear in the newspapers is is about learning in very humble detail the problems and very often not finding anything of relevance okay but in order to find something you have to try and to try you have to learn so what we have done is to try to learn on the quantum side problems that might be relevant in crypto and on the crypto side you know, uh, learning also the possibilities of quantum computation and since we are learning all these things we we have decided to code them okay so if Whenever we have a real quantum computer big enough, we simply already have the algorithms. Uh, and we look for possibilities of having finding cracks in the methods. Cracks, cracks based on quantum, okay, the fact that you attack with the quantum device. So we have uh, work on two examples. Let me show the very first. The very first is really to, to invert a hash function. So the idea. Again, done with Sergi, with Emmanuel, with uh, Mark and Victor, is to take a toy model for a hash and see how uh, a quantum computer could attack that problem. How, how do you do that? And uh, to find the difficulties, and maybe look for tricks. So the idea is to use Crover algorithm. Let me remind you that Crover Based, let me use my mouse <clears throat> on this idea. You have a structure that we call an oracle. Okay. And this oracle uh, has a piece that will change the sign of the solution as a coefficient of the superposition you are handling. Uh, and then you have a diffusion. The basic idea of all this block of what we call a proper step is to amplify the probability of measuring the solution of the problem. So this is the, all the idea. As I said before, the output is probabilistic. So everything is about enhancing the probability little by little. So how do you do that? OK, so we went into a particular example and we and uh, we cooked uh, an example, a toy cha cha base hash, hash function with 16 bits. OK, not a huge one. And we analyze the cha-cha quarter rotation. And here it goes. No? Uh, this is the definition of this rotation. And this rotation is made with additions, with bitwise additions, with um, uh, translation, uh, translating the, the bits in the register. And one by one, these actions, we map them into a quantum circuit. Okay. So this is the way we represent the qubits a long time. So from left to right, it's time is passing. And simply we start and we add A plus B with another. We will look now at the other. And then after that, we have to make a big wise uh, addition, control knot additions with D. So now we make the control knots so adding into A. And then we, we, we make the shift okay, here, not to shift the rotation which is nothing, by the way. It's simply a reassignment of the bit of the qubits in this case. So we simply have to remember what you have to do on the next step. And this is how you translate one of these quarter rotations into a secret. But of course, you need the add. Well, add is not simple in quantum uh, mechanics. We have to, this was done in the 90s, the algorithms that do all these basic operations. Actually, uh, Arthur Ecker was today uh, talking, and he is one of the guys who started all to, to produce all the diagrams, all the secrets for the basic operations. So the Atmo then uh, is decomposed in a lot of toffoli and control knots at some 
XOR, uh, some uh, OR, not OR. Change flip uh, of the qubit, okay, X. And, uh, and this, in turn, as I said, can be reduced to two body uh, gates in quantum mechanics, not in classical mechanics. And, and you may notice that we need ancilla. Uh, this is also happening in classical computation. You need carriers sometimes, but here you need one, and you have to leave it untouched. If it started at zero, it must end up at zero. Okay? So it's an ancilla because you can use it and, and reuse it among the computation. So when you put together uh, the four quarter rotations into one of the cha-cha interaction, well, this is the, the kind of circuit you have. Um, then you need the diffusion. The diffusion was discussed again in the 90s, and it, it is essentially uh, the difficult part is an extremely controlled uh, knot, so controlled to everybody, uh, knot. But that, uh, there is no such thing in nature. So how do you do that? Well, again, it turns out that you can write any of these multi-control gates as a series, uh, uh, efficient series, it's not exponential, it's a polynomial series of, in this case, Toffolis. And the Toffoli reduce again to 15, two body gates. So as I said, this is done in the 90s, in the 95. Well, uh, when you put everything together, it's a highly non-trivial uh, set of operations because you have all the pieces I was mentioning, the oracle, the diffusion, and here you prepare the system to explore every possibility. And now, as I said, the combination is a proper step that the only thing which is trying to do is enhance enhancing the probability of, of measuring in the very end your solution. Uh, you can count. Now it's not a, those countings that you can read in papers. This is an actual counting, natural, no, not an arbitrary counting. So the total number of Toffolis, depending on the n bits of the problem and the size of the uh, of the permutation, is of the it scales linearly. The synapse linearly and the single qubit gates linearly. And the depth, so how many of them you can do at a time. So what is the depth of the circuit scales linearly. This you would call an efficient circuit because as the size of your problem increases, the size of the circuit is linear, okay? It increases only linearly, it's an efficient. But how many times you have to run that? Well, according to Grover, square root of the space where your solution lives. So in this particular case, we have n bits. So the space of search is two to the n, it's an exponential size. And Grover will give us a square root of n. Uh, well, the, this is very nice. In this particular example, okay, uh, as I said, that we are considering, uh, you can see we have programmed everything. So, and you can check on the GitHub, you can download and see every piece of what I said. And this is a plot which is very elegant. On the horizontal line here, you have all the possible solutions and uh, the height of every point is the probability of measuring that particular item. This example contains two pre-images and you see that as you run Grover and Grover iterations and going to the right, Little by little, the probability of the two three images keeps growing, yeah? and eventually they peak, and then they would go down because quantum mechanics is unitary evolution. So eventually, you go back to the origin. Okay, you have to stop at the right point to then measure, and you would, with extremely high probability, measure the solution. Actually, you can get close as close to one as you want. Uh, we have done now that we have everything. We have done many, many tests. So for instance, we have checked how the entanglement of the system evolves. It's amazing. Entanglement in Grover is maximum on the very first iteration. And this is so deep because if entanglement were not high, I could simulate it with techniques which are called tensor networks. It's the most powerful way of simulating quantum mechanics. So it would turn that by a very paradoxical way of operating, uh, we would uh, 
find the solution by using a quantum algorithm, which is never used on a quantum computer, but simulated with a very clever technique. So what prevents this uh, trick is the fact that entanglement is maximal on the very first step of Grover's algorithm. That's a, like, a, like a profound obstruction, no? that's there preventing you a free launch on the ground. So another trick. So why don't we simply stop the computation in one go? There is already a, a lot of probability for the solution. So could we immediately read the solution? Well, there is a trade-off here. If I only uh, run one time, one step of Grover, I only enhance the probability of success very little. And then uh, that on when I do my measurements, okay, I will see the solution. Well, I need to do it very many times. I do have to sample many more times. Uh, this is a plot that, this is a table that it's telling on a little bit how many times we have to run it, given that the probability is so low. And, uh, you know, when you see, uh, typically, uh, you will get of the order of eight steps to get the solution. So probability one, uh, you should run one time. Uh, than in eight steps. And if you check the multiplication, typically is eight. So again, no free launch. There is no strategy, absolutely no strategy, that if I step stop my Grover any in the first, second, third, four, five, six, seven, I will gain more. They are almost equally probable. The solution will take the very, very same effort. Well, if this is so, okay, and maintaining the time of coherence is a complete, it's very difficult. So it will turn out practical on a quantum computer to stop before and run it more times. So the total amount of times will be constant, yet I will maintain uh, coherence. So it's an efficient method. Okay. Uh, let me go to the second problem. Okay. And this is the uh, Binary codes. Uh, these again, Sergi, Nashua, Emmanuel, Carlos, Ruge, Mark, uh, in preparation. Here we took a completely different approach. So rather than doing a grover, we go to what we call uh, an annealer. So the problem is that you are giving functions which are mod two of a number of variables, which is the input. And this is the larger space. And you add an error. And you want to find these things. So how do you do that? Well, this is not easy because to start with physics doesn't know anything about mod two in an annealer. So how do you do that? So for every problem we have been finding, we found a solution. So let me go a little bit through the problems and the solutions. Well, first is that the mod two operation can be uh, done in normal form with the trick of substituting Xi plus Xj where these are bits by xi plus xj minus 2xi xj. This always gives the very same result, mod 2. So we can get rid of the mod 2, paying a price, which is that we generate terms which are not, which are polynomials, okay, of higher order. So actually, when you take every function fully arbitrary, even linear codes, you will have an all to all interaction. But then, nature there is no such a thing as all to all interaction so how do you reduce a three uh, body interaction to only two terms well you have a trick which is you add a new variable x y j and you add a multiplier lagrange multiplier that assures you that x i j is the product of x i x j so in this way products of three are reduced to all of them are products of two and this is a trick the not trivial fact about this trick is that this is a positive function. So if it is obeyed, it fulfills the purpose that xij is the product of xi times xj. If it is not the product, it's always higher. As you may see, it's three plus one, four, minus two, minus two, minus four. This is done in such a way, very cleverly, that it is always positive, positively defined. The bad thing is that to reduce uh, all to all interactions to two body interactions, you will need an exponential number of ancillas. In the case of eight bits, we needed 30 ancillas. And then we add another trick. 
What about trying to use the annealer as a machine that interrogates the problem, give us some information, and then we repeat the interrogation in a more clever way? That's exactly what we did. We simply went, we put that in the wave. The mapping into the wave went to 90 qubits because they have they need redundancy because of the non-contiguous relations of the qubits. And then we run it and look. The solution is a vertical line. We have no output with the solution. But little by little, we realize that the low energy of, the, of this machine, many of the qubits were always on the same value. So the people near the solution, they were showing us something. So we fixed them to th that number that we read. And on the second go, we were running less qubits with some fix because they were the common to all the low energy spectrum. And suddenly we enhanced the probability of the low spectrum. And finally, we did another time and lo and behold, the probability of the solution was there and we found the solution. So by nested use of this technique, we found the solution. Uh, we did a new trick uh, and this is maybe too late to tell you, but we use what is called nested rover is that if the number of uh, bits involved in a particular set of functions is not the total, well, do a Grover only on them. So I'm back to Grover. And then uh, you look at more of these functions and they share the first qubits and they need some extra ones. Okay, do it. Do, so do a Grover, which is, you know, uh, hierarchical. And what happens is that you can prove that every two functions you, you put, you kill out of four options three and you get one. So you go from n solutions to n fours, to n 16, to n 64. Till you need to use all the qubits and then you apply the standard problem. So this produces an advantage of two to the n of the two minus k. k being the number of times you can do that. In practice, in a problem of, of 256 bits mapped into 512, K was of the order of uh, six. So, it, you know, it's two to the 128 minus six. So it's a very minor and irrelevant proof. So my conclusions is that uh, we have analyzed a hash problem and nonlinear codes. On the first, we, we explicitly construct every piece of the algorithms. And we discovered that control knots, sort rotations and adds are friendly to quantum mechanics, but and other algorithms, other hash, which are based on n, it would be much worse. We need many more ancillas. We found no free launch on the first passage uh, idea, and uh, we found no way to use tensor networks to simulate the process. On the nonlinear code, we did the mapping to annealing, okay? And we discovered that mod two is a big problem that generates multiple interactions, and then we reduce them to two body interaction with tricks of unseelings. And we found a way, at least in this example, to find a solution. Nested Grover produced only a marginal uh, improvement. And I think I'm, I run out of time and run out of everything. So thank you very much. <clears throat> thank you very much, Jose Ignacio. Um, we have like one or two minutes if there is any question. So the question is, what do you think of the technology behind D-Waves quantum computers or quantum annealing? Well, there is a big discussion now on whether <clears throat> the technology used by D-Wave uh, uh, can produce any advantage at all. Okay, the criticism is extremely serious. And uh, the idea is that there are papers of uh, November where uh, the physics, underlying the, the way the, the qubits of uh, the way work was simulated uh, or can be simulated without what is called a sign problem. So this is a bad news for, um, for them. Although there are already a number of people trying to bring a solution uh, saying that with uh, small modifications of, uh, of the transmit qubits, you would uh, have the same problem and therefore the ability to do things which are not doable on a classical computer so that efficiently okay so this is a, a discussion which is going on in the community 
Thank you very much. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, Hussein Nasir.